Welcome, everybody. It's my great uh, pleasure to welcome today Jennifer Smith Winson Windsor. I'm so sorry. I apologize for butchering your name. I just couldn't right. talk. <laughs> So it's my great pleasure to welcome today Jennifer Smith Windsor, who is a Canadian textile artist based in uh, Ontario yes. and um, who I discovered through the 62 group of textile artists. And before we go into her work, Jennifer, I'd love for you to share your story a little bit. How did you get into um, what you're doing now? What is the, when did the magic start and what, <laughs> what created the magic? It was a long process. I have to be honest that, um, well, for starters, I grew up in a very creative household. My mom is a watercolor artist. And I would say that summers at our cottage were certainly very formative in developing a creative and um, self-sufficient and making environment. So our summers always usually revolved around theme summers where we would find a book at the library and then create a world that went around that book, whether it be Treasure Island or Painted Arrows. So part of that also was we would create costumes, we would make uh, tents if we had to. So um, I think that that uh, creative aspect and the making was instilled in me from a very early age. As for this love affair with textiles and fabrics, I, I would honestly can't, I can't say a time when I didn't have that love. Um, I was an embroiderer. And in fact, if you can see behind me on my bulletin board, I found this at our cottage when I was cleaning it up last summer. It's probably the earliest example of my technical prowess as an embroiderer. So two very small pieces of um, very rudimentary and basic embroidery that was from a kit, um, which so many of us as children were introduced to, at least my generation. Um, it, evolved into me making clothing, making dolls clothing. And uh, I developed a love of theater at some point and so worked in theater. Um, and I think that also gave me an appreciation for historical textiles, historical fashion. Um, and I did have the great opportunity to work um, in uh, two of one of Canada's largest uh, theaters in the wardrobe department and then subsequently in a smaller theater prior to then moving overseas with my husband. Um, and with the termination of my professional life and moving into being a mother, um, I found that the textiles was a very easy and accessible um, way for me to still express my creativity. So I lived in the UK and was able to take uh, courses throughout and then decided that I would pursue uh, postgraduate studies um, at the University of uh, Hatfield, which offered a um, master's in contemporary craft. And so through all of those bringing together all of those distant different pieces, I think at some point uh, I realized that I wanted to have an art practice. It's not that I didn't have an art practice, but I think it's, um, it's then making space for it and making um, that commitment that you're going to devote uh, the majority of your time to something that you feel um, really fulfills you and that you are able to express yourself. Um, and I would say for textile, for me, it's uh, because I work um, predominantly with secondhand textiles, in fact, now exclusively with secondhand textiles, that using them makes helps me sort of make sense of the world and particularly in this world that is becoming um, so digitized and so um, non-material. 
that um, I sort of have these as sort of reminders and memory keepers of past, which I feel that they're very, they strongly resonate. So right. I'd like to, uh, before we, we go uh, further, I'd like to capture a little bit or, or unpack a little bit the moment where you moved from having a, a profession, as you said, to becoming an artist. And what were the changes that needed to occur for you at a, at a personal, emotional, intellectual level to be able to make that leap? Because it's a very different approach. Very different. I mean, I think that um, there's nothing like an extended period of time that sort of helps you shift your focus. So I think working is a very immersive and environment so that you can become very consumed by that um, environment. And when there is a break, which I had because of moving overseas, moving different countries, then becoming a mother, um, there, I sort of lost in some ways that external uh, influence. And so what has had to happen was that I guess it gave me time to sort of look internally and then realize that um, that expression, which I think was still, you know, very much applied because of the work that I did in theater, it became a more personal um, expression. And that um, I think that to living in the United, United Kingdom, um, which has such an incredibly rich and um, rigorous approach to uh, textile craft and art that it sort of it, it broadened my horizons and made, made me realize that um, you know having an art practice was was viable um, that there were ones that people had gone ahead and done this and that there was a, a, a community so the community that I'd lost when I was working in the theater um, I found that community again within a broader context within textile art and craft. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, again, like the, I have to say like the 62 group, um, I always had those members on a pedestal and um, to be now part of that group is a tremendous, uh, reward for me. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. The 62 group, um, some of the um, uh, members in the audience will, will know who they are, but maybe not everybody. So give us uh, maybe just a, a short version of who they are. And uh, interest, I mean, what I'm really interested in is how did you, how did you get, you know, accepted, <laughs> brought in? <laughs> And, and recognized and, and yes. nice as a member. Yes, exactly, exactly. Because I think, and you know, I have to be very careful how I phrase this, but within um, craft, there are varying levels, right? I mean, we've all been to the craft shows where, you know, people try their hand at felting or embroidery or a bit of crochet. Um, and, it's where that division goes from a being more of a hobby to something that is recognized probably because of time spent and commitment to the craft that um, there's another level that is reached. So the 62 group is the UK's oldest cooperative, textile operated cooperative of textile artists that was um, established back in 1962 it now has 65 members and I'm not exactly sure when it opened up uh, to international members, but um, very thankful that it has. So um, to, to become a member of the 62 group, every year they do a call for um, interested members and you have to send in uh, representative photographs of, of your work today to your bio and you're then selected through one one degree of selection and then if you make it through the first round you then have to send um, pieces of your work 
to the uh, selection committee and based on the quality and the um, uniqueness of your work. Um, and they're looking for certainly uh, a different approach, a creative approach, so that it's not just technical skill that they're looking for. They're also looking for um, a uniqueness in the way that the artists are approaching their work. Um, and then when you're selected, then you pop your champagne cork and you become part of this long tradition of very committed um, textile artists. And they really stress active involvement. So um, there's um, exhibitions that either they're asked to participate in, for example, the Whitaker, with, which was part of the British Textile Biennial. And also they have um, exhibitions that they organize as a group and you are expected to produce work or contribute to work to it. Um, and they do have a strike policy. So if you don't have work selected um, three, I think it's like three strikes you're out. So yes. <laughs> the pressure so is- I want to, Yeah. Um, it's important to note that there are, I think, only two Canadian uh, textile artists who are part yes. of the, uh, the 62 yes. group. So yes. it's, it's a great privilege. Um, you mentioned a little earlier the, uh, the Whitaker exhibit. Yes. Which was um, at the British Textile Biennial, where um, I had a, a visit with some of the artists there. And the theme was to show the connections that cloth makes, um, you know, textile mm -hmm. makes around the world. Yes. Um, I will, when I post this video, I will put the link to uh, the interview I did because I did show your work there. Can you give us a little bit, and I'm sorry, I don't have a photo of it, but okay. maybe you could describe um, what the work was and the inspiration and the message that you shared. Yes. The idea was uh, for the British Textile Biennial this year was to look at the global impact of textiles and fashion and how um, the area that the biennial was um, exhibited at, which is Rossendale in Lancashire, which was such an incredibly um, pivotal uh, place for fat. Um, textile manufacture and also uh, the industrial revolution. It sort of put Britain on the map in terms of its um, wealth and influence in the industrial revolution. Um, and so it was a, a very broad reaching um, brief in that we were to incorporate personal um, as well as global um, ideas. And again, I mean, that's one of the most it's just a wonderful challenge. So I had this beautiful, um, I think it's probably around 1860s, a, a bodice, a silk bodice that a, a friend had gifted to me. And uh, it was so exquisitely made with absolutely nothing to denote who made it, um, really when it had been made, whether, I mean, clearly it was all handmade. There wasn't uh, any, um, machine making. So I knew that it wasn't a costume. Um, and it made me think about the woman who had made it, presumably a woman, and all the women who work in the textile industry. Um, and also of that period in Britain, which the bodice generally represented about how that, you know, had a huge impact on the fact that women were active, actively engaged in workforce, but also that they were you know, nameless. So I went into my cupboard and I removed all the labels off of my clothing, making them as equally no name as this beautiful bodice that I had in my possession. And then I took the labels and embroidered them onto a ribbon and then decorated the bodice and then embroidered, labeled, onto the bodice to note that it had been labeled. Um, but this juxtaposition between these, um, these labels that have designer labels on them and um, sizing labels from all over the world, um, mm -hmm. contrasting with um, this exquisite piece. So it was, 
this whole idea of where we've come from in terms of our uh, approach to fashion and clothing and fast fashion and you know how everything's so disposable and and just reflecting on this impact of um, the beginnings of the textile industrial revolution and right. um, where we're at now and the other really surprising thing to me is that I knew our family had connections to the textile industry and my my dad has a um, our family tree where a relative had done extensive research so he said you know I think there's something in there why don't you just read through anyway found out that the Smith and the Windsors both had textile um, mills in uh, Backup or back, Backup, which is about 15 minutes from the Whitaker Museum and um, were two of the textile industrialists, the, the merchants who made Amazing. lots of money, <laughs> lost <laughs> it, but made lots of money. So they directly resulted or, or benefited from the industrial revolution and all of its ugliness and all of its exploitation. Right. Yeah, the right. family was part of that. So, so um, I'd like to talk a little bit now about the, uh, the project that you currently um, are exhibiting. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna be sharing my screen and showing um, uh, your work. Uh, there we are. So um, you worked with blankets. Yes, yes, eight, eight blankets, eight military blankets. And that's an important distinction to make. Um, and again, like the conversation that you and I had um, a month ago, how um, aptly we felt this series fitted into the conflict uh, and craft uh, focus of this month. So this series, um, this series started five years ago. Um, and I wanted to look at the idea of security and how security is expressed both uh, as a security of the state, which the blankets represent and the security of the home, which the doilies and the lace represent. And I wanted to integrate the two of them um, using hand embroidery, my hand embroidery. So the, um, the first blanket was the, the Swiss army blanket, which is the one that you see in the center um, in the, on the bed. Um, and uh, that was sort of the first uh, test piece, but it quickly, when I started working on it, I realized that um, there was something in this idea and that uh, doing more than one and doing uh, a series from blankets that are roughly from around the Second World War would make a strong impact. Um, just thinking about the global nature of security and how all nations were touched by this um, idea of sacrifice and how women stayed at home and looked after the home front and the men went out and fought um, in the war. And of course, when I started the series, the idea was very interesting, but um, because of COVID-19 and we've had to look very, very closely at um, how we view security and uh, home for many was not a place of security. And also mm -hmm. as, as nations, we had to figure out how we were going to protect our own, um, keep our, our country safe and secure, um, but still recognizing that we were looking at this from a global pr perspective. So the blankets, I mean, again, like the thing about secondhand textiles is that there's already a narrative embedded in them. Um, and then when you put two, items or elements of this, then the story expands and becomes greater. And 
that's for me the challenge and the thing that I love about the secondhand textiles is that you build on their story, their memory keepers, but you can then just expand that whole um, idea and association. So, so I mean, I, I yeah, I think textile has the memory of all yeah. the people who have owned it, and um, I, I strongly believe almost in the in the spirit, um, in the spirit of it almost. Um, so these, these blankets are at the moment um, being displayed in Stratford, Ontario at the, uh, the Stratford Gallery. And they come, how many countries um, do you have represented? The gray one, what country is that? That's Canada. And, and um, this, can you see my cursor? I think it's the one behind with the red. Is that the one you're pointing to? Yes, brown and red, yes. Brown and red, that um, is Switzerland. And the khaki one with the long doily there? That's United States. And the blue? Russia, okay. not the Soviet Union. So that was the one where I slightly erred from the 19 or the war era narrative, but it right. still works. Um, so we're going to see some details here. Um, yeah. I, I wanted to show. So, are they all the same size, or do nations no. have, a, have an idea on what the ideal size is? <laughs> there was no, that was the there was two things that really surprised me: the colors and the sizes. So there isn't any two that are the same size, and I think that the colors um, were as I say, a very pleasant surprise for me because it meant that I could select um, embroidery flosses that uh, went along with the colors of the blanket. Um, right. I should also mention that when I was um, choosing the embroidery stitches, I mean, there are hundreds and hundreds of embroidery stitches, um, but for the purposes of this series, I wanted to stick to very uh, basic and the most utilitarian of stitches. So um, I limited the repertoire to blanket stitch, obviously, running stitch, um, back stitch, um, and um, cross stitch as well. Um, and it allowed me and forced me to be very creative in the way that I used my stitching because I had that limited repertoire. So um, in the photograph to the right, you can see that um, there's a lot of um, blanket stitching, but there's what you call whipped blanket stitch, um, which is where the contrasting um, gray and then the black is each, um, it's, it's threaded through each of the the blanket stitch to create like this coil. And um, when I was um, preparing um, sort of studies, so this was my sampler of um, just working with different uh, stitches and, and sort of figuring out what would work, what wouldn't work. But you can see Marion, like that. Sorry, um, Marion, can you put the, uh, the spotlight just on Jennifer so we can really see uh, the work here, that would be great. Thank you. So this was my sampler. Um, and this is um, blanket stitch, um, all blanket stitch. So you can see the tremendous variety of uh, different stitches and techniques that can be um, combinations mm -hmm. used for that. And then, of course, being able to translate that um, to each blanket um, and the thing about them is that they work individually, but there's also a connection between all of them because of this commonality of using the same stitches. Right. So, We're going to go back to the, um, uh, the photos, but I'd like to just say that if anybody has a question, please, I know that they are um, uh, textile enthusiasts in the, uh, in the audience. And if you have any questions, please feel free to, uh, yes, to just ask away. put the, uh, the question in the chat box or just, um, uh, just you know, unmute yourself and ask your question. So let's go back to, um, 
sharing the images of your work. So this is the Canadian blanket. Yes, this is a Canadian blanket. And I should say that um, at the, we were really lucky that we could actually have an opening for the Stratford um, exhibition. The craft gallery exhibit, which was the first photograph that you saw, um, which was in Toronto. Um, unfortunately, the gallery was open, but with very limited um, right. viewership. And then three weeks later, we went into yet another lockdown. So it had like a flash, but um, what I really missed was the engagement with viewers. Yeah. And that was such a wonderful thing to be able to have at the Stratford Gallery because of the response. As an artist, you work often in isolation. You have an idea. And, you know, for this one, it took me a long time, but you never really know how it will be received. Although for this one, I felt that it really was going to resonate with people. Mm -hmm. So when I had a man come up to me at the exhibit and said, you know, that blanket, we used to have those blankets at my grandpa's cottage. We used to have those on our bed. That's For amazing. Me, that kind of thing is what makes the use of secondhand textiles so uh, powerful. And that's, you know, I could not have asked for uh, a better anecdote, you know, and again, like the response from people the number of people that came up and said, you know, I have doilies of my grandmother and I, I'm sure it's of a generation of, you know, our, our age group. I'm not sure if the 20 year olds would have the same kind of reaction, but they were in everybody's home. And chances are, if you go in the back of somebody's linen cupboard, they're gonna find a pile because they're so beautiful. Mm -hmm. You can't get rid of them, but what do you do with them? I mean, they're, there's, there's something they were so ubiquitous in everybody's life and and now they're not of any value uh really so again like i feel i'm somewhat of a, cons a custodian of the past and these objects so if i can sure. use them in a way that gives them life and you know really recognition going back to the idea of the woman who made the bodice like these are unknown women who made these exquisite pieces that um you know it, it, they just are of a different era and yet you cannot um you cannot ignore the fact that they're just so beautifully made so so the lace that you have used on each uh blanket is from the country of the blanket it would have been nice but um it i just couldn't be that uh specific right. i mean mm -hmm. i i collected um, I think the blanket that I did of Italy was the one that had ones that were actually from Italy. Um, but the rest, it was, it was very difficult for me to find ones that were from the country. Do you know, you know do you know, um, I mean, this is the, this is the Canadian one. Um, do you know why it's gray? And I, I actually, I thought that every military item would be khaki. <laughs> so did I. So did I. So I was I was prepared for a very green journey, but uh, in fact, there's really only the two that are green. There's uh, Germany and the United States. And um, I know you don't have a photograph of it, but Australia was just the biggest shocker to me because it was this beautiful teal green with coral, which just seems very unmilitary to me. But um, <laughs> there is so a like the the gray. Um, because again, it, it's always hard to really, really have authentic authentication of them. But the the person I purchased the gray blanket from said that yes, indeed, it was military issue from, you know, in and around the Second World War. So I have to go with his, um, and certainly the story of the the man who had them at his grandpa's cottage mm -hmm. seemed to suggest that it, they were of that era. There is, uh, we have a question for you. Are the shapes arranged aesthetically or do they tell a story as well? They're aesthetically. Um, it's, you know, I wanted to have quite a, a, a regimented, if that's the right word, or linear placement. Um, I didn't feel that they lent themselves to sort of an organic placement, but that's right. because many of them had like the stripes. 
So no, there isn't anything apart from me making that decision to present them in a certain way. Right. So the, the blue blanket is the Russian one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where did you source a Russian blanket? <laughs> from my um, mother-in-law. <laughs> So my, my husband is Russian, and um, when I was starting the series, I wanted to have as many blankets represented as I could, so I asked her if she could find one for me, so she did, and she mailed it to me. So. Um, and I, I just noticed here there is a red thread. I noticed yeah. a red dot here on the other one, too. Yeah. Is, what's the significance of that? Is that the Canadian touch? I'm not sure it's it's uh I can't see it here but what I wanted to or what I didn't want to do was mask the flaws um and I and I wanted to really celebrate and draw uh focus to the fact that there were irregularities if if a blanket was mended I circled the mending with the red um in this one with the Russia, these were the joining of two pieces of lace. So I didn't want to um, mask it. I just feel that it it uh, speaks to the integrity and the authenticity of the material, and that I wasn't trying to um, mend it. I was just there to present it in in such a way, uh, and it, it reflects, I think, too, like. Um, flaws are not necessarily something that should be eliminated and sometimes we have to accept them and so this was a way of me accepting irregularities and um memorializing them in a way well in the um in the era of um photoshop and everything being yeah. perfect i think celebrating uh, irregularities and yeah. flaws is is actually a great thing right and i think um I'm very influenced too by the the um, Japanese um, aesthetic of wabi sabi, which is yeah. the perfect and the imperfect. I mean, it's it's hard, I think, for Westerners to really understand that the the tremendous subtlety of the wabi sabi. But um, again, like I I really celebrate and really look for imperfection in some ways it, it it's almost a starting point for me which i'll talk about a bit more with um the hudson bay blanket series that yeah. i'm working on um, so can we uh, i just want to finish with these two blankets sure. because yeah. i'd like to uh, have some time to talk about your current project yeah. uh -huh. um, which which one is this one this is um, the United Kingdom, and this, according to the seller, this belonged to uh, his father, who was a military doctor, and military issue blankets were often in cream or white, um, and uh, he, I guess, had taken and had it with him until he passed away. And um, Is that the yeah. same one? That's the same one, yeah. Same this, one. Is, this is a very large blanket. This is over two meters by 196 meters. Wow. 1. 6, sorry, 1. 2. 2. over two meters by 1.96 meters. So really, really big, really, yeah. really big. It's really big. Yeah. So um, you are still working with the blankets and you are yeah, still- I thought I, I, Actually, I thought I was done. I sort of thought, <laughs> yes, we've worked this through. <laughs> I've been at it for a while, but serendipity. So um, David Kay, who, uh, owned a craft gallery in Toronto for many years and just closed it, I think, maybe just before COVID, I think. Yeah, I just spoke to him two weeks ago. Did you? Yes, well, we just met two weeks ago. Well, this is David's blanket. Ah. <laughs> so he saw the exhibit and, you know, reached out to Jana and said, I have this blanket that's not we're not using anymore do you think jennifer would like it and so jana reached out and said you know would you like this blanket and i thought well you know i i can never say no to a gift so i said sure i would be happy to have your blanket so within three days i had it in my post box and i 
opened it up. And for me, it's just the, it is like the perfect blanket because it's got holes in it and it's torn. So I wrote him and I said, David, you've got to tell me about this blanket. I need to have its story because that always sort of helps it, it internalizes, makes it more personal. So he said that he and his wife, it had been their blanket since they were married. And as soon as before they turned the heat on, it was always on their bed, but it was getting so tatty that he knew it was time to replace it. But what was he going to do with it? So he sent it my way. So it's so it's, let's open it and uh, okay. let's open it and hear the story. So um, there's no doubt um, that the Hudson Bay blanket is a very um, it's iconically Canadian, but it has a very very complicated. Uh, and controversial history. Yeah. So embarking on this series, I've had to do a lot of thinking and considering because of the uh, relationship that the blanket has had with uh, the indigenous people of Canada and the Métis people of Canada, and also how to look at also the impact that the of colonialization on this country. So it, it's, I've, I've been thinking about it for quite some time. I've been working on it, but I've been quite tentative trying to work through. Um, research always helps to sort of contextualize it. Um, so of course, historically, there is the um, reference that the early military in the 1800s used the blankets to spread smallpox disease throughout the indigenous people's community. It's never been definitively proven, but there has been textual references to it. So I think by association, because the Hudson Bay blanket was used so widely in trade, there's the association that, oh, it must have been used for that. So there's that element, I mean, apart from the fact that it is definitely referencing the age of the uh, fur trade and the relationship that the settlers had with the indigenous peoples. Now the Métis people of the West Coast have a very different association with the blanket in that it's, um, they worked very closely with uh, the, the settlers at first and the Hudson Bay Company and uh, benefited in many ways from that relationship. And uh, as a coming of age, in their coming of age ceremonies, uh, a, a, a Hudson Bay blanket is gifted usually to the women when they become, and they drape it over their shoulders and it's a sign of their progression into womanhood. I mean, this is from research and I you know, cannot speak as an authority on this. Anyhow, but I've been trying to figure out how to sort of, let my um, let my pass too because I'm I'm a British uh, I'm descended from British uh, heritage and you know I have a third fourth, fourth generation Canadian father and my mom came over from England but certainly you know we are of we're the colonializers or whatever so try and trying to work that without I can't speak to the um, the indigenous person's experience. But what I can do is look at this blanket and how it represents country, land. So um, this is so far, it's a work in progress, as you can see. So we have uh, the, it's a three and a half point stripe blanket. Um, it's quite thin really and it's probably about um, before 1960. Um, the label certainly indicates that that's um, when it this type of blanket was made. So there are signs of wear, possibly moth holes, um, throughout the blanket and again referencing the idea of not masking flaws I have chosen to circle all of them using backstitch. And 
the idea of landscape now has is going to be represented by um, the inspiration from topographic maps. So my stitching now is going to, I'm going to cover this with um, topographically inspired stitching. So um, I have this um, image that I got from the internet to show a very stylized version of one. Right. Um, and I'm going to then stitch across the blanket. I mean, it always evolves as well. So this will happen and then something else will happen. I know that. Um, and also I have in the middle, I've taken uh, four vintage hankies of the same color tones of the stripes. And my idea is that the hankies uh, reference the suffering and the pain of making a nation, forging a nation. Um, and so that- Where did you source them from? Pardon me? Where did you source them from? Um, flea markets, gifts. Right. Yeah. Uh, I mean, like most textile artists, we kind of have a secret stash, which only a few people know about. <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, it's good. It's a good thing I have a basement. Uh, but uh, that's yeah, so I, I, the um, the the um, places that you are going to represent uh, through topography um, uh, rendering are they going to be linked to the story of um, the David Kay who gifted the blanket? Or are they going to be linked to the story of Canada itself or, or Ontario or how are you I, going to choose I those? I think, um, I don't know if I want to make it so literal that you could look at that and say, oh, the Rockies are over there. Because right. I can't do that really because I'm using the flaws as my reference points. They are right. my peaks, if you may, if you will, in terms of how I'm creating. So... Um, I think that, again, you know, they're my canvas as well, um, as a painter would have their linen, I have my blanket, so um, I roughly work out, um, but I know that something else is going to happen when I stitch, so I'll get to a certain point and I know that I'll then um, incorporate something, but um, it will it will be a suggestion of landscape and a suggestion yeah. of land as opposed to a literal representation yeah. of Canada. Yeah. yeah. Is the blanket going to go back to David Kay or? He hasn't it... asked for it. I don't know. <laughs> maybe he'll say. I actually was. You're not the only one that's asked me that. And I was thinking maybe just gift like lent it to me to work on it and I have to give it back to him which I would be more than happy to do I would be right. more than happy to do I've never actually met him you know he's sort of like this iconic figure within the craft gallery and uh yeah. so I'm hoping that one one day I'll be able to but I have two other blankets um and so I have another one that's again the the traditional stripe and then during the 50s and 60s the Hudson Bay blanket did it or company did another, um, they incorporated different colors. Um, so I have a, a brown one with black stripes, which I think is going to be a very personal one. I, I have some, again, old embroidery. I have a, if you can believe it, an old embroidered beaver that I did from a kit when I was like 12. So it was like, oh, that's gotta go on. So we'll figure out, I'll figure out somehow to, Right. incorporate that one and whether it'll be like a triptych or whether I'll do more I don't know I don't know yet we'll see how it goes but well, it's a fantastic project uh, in the pipeline thank you That's, uh, yeah I, I again it's like it's something that has to be I think treated with a great deal of um, uh, thoughtfulness and a mindfulness as to uh, how it, I'm not sure how it will be received so I have to be very like respectful, I guess, of yeah. the different narratives that are tied with the blanket. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Really, a real pleasure to uh, a real pleasure to see you and and to Thank hear you. all about your your work. Thank you for taking the time to share it with us. 
Um, I will put again, as I said, the link to uh, the Whitaker exhibit in which your work is also displayed. Yes. And um, I hope that many people send you blankets and <laughs> do their stories yes. because I think it would be an amazing I gift. I do too. For, you know, I'm thinking, be... I'm thinking wedding gift to children and yeah. uh, you pass yeah. on a story, a part of their story through a blanket and yeah. uh, it would be an yeah. amazing gift. So uh, well, I think thank you so much. With doilies and what have you, we've all got them. So it, it, it'll give us, you know, pause for thought of, hmm, maybe we can do something with these. So thank you, Isabel. Yeah.